well, but it's a key topic that we are talking with, with clients uh, about. Now, more often than not, we're finding digital marketing was already on the agenda and looking at digital sales and marketing. Uh, but that's obviously uh, increased rapidly since, uh, since the onset of, of COVID and brought plans forward in some cases, but it's also forced people to take a, a look at digital sales and marketing when perhaps they hadn't really considered about it. Um, just to talk about some of the speakers uh, and why you know we've got who we've got on the uh, the call, I guess this morning. Those of you who attend our face-to-face -face, uh, seminars will do will know we do do a number of seminars with Barclays, and we were talking with our colleagues at Barclays about this topic, and they were telling us actually, you know, they're experiencing the same the same thing with their client base. So we've got Barclay Card on the call this morning and going to give some really interesting insights into to trends and activity that they're seeing uh, in the digital sales and marketing space. So we've brought the panel together. Um, Chris is joining from Barclay Card, so he's going to talk about the rise of e-commerce um, since the onset of uh, COVID. Uh, in particular, there's going to be some really interesting slides from Chris, as you'll hear in a minute. After Chris has finished, we're going to hear from uh, from Dale from uh, Wine and Something. And Dale uh, is an entrepreneur whose business has been transformed uh, by digital sales and marketing uh, after the onset of uh, COVID uh, hit his uh, more traditional uh, business model. So again, you're going to get a great presentation from, from Dale. And then finally, we've got Ben Meekin, who's going to be talking from, uh, from Fluid. So Fluid are a highly progressive uh, digital marketing agency that work with Dale on his project. They're also our marketing agency and we work on a number of mutual clients together. So it's great to hear from, from Ben, who's going to be talking about some of the exciting developments, I guess, that are coming down the track. Uh, some, some tips and also some exciting developments that are coming down the track that people need to be aware of when they're looking at this topic. Um, and then, as I say, what we'll do when our three speakers are finished, we'll go into Q&A, uh, just an open discussion, uh, questions put to, uh, to the panellists. Just to let you know, the recording and the slides will be circulated as well at the, uh, at the end. So, without further ado, um, we'll get the presentation underway. Ed, I'm going to have to ask if you can control alongside the relevant presenters when it comes to it, because I obviously can't do that at the moment. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, Simon, and uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I um, hope everyone's keeping well and safe and that you can uh, hear me loud and clear. But um, th thanks for inviting us uh, along today, Simon. It's really great to have the opportunity to, to, to speak today and uh, hopefully give you, like you say, some, some interesting insights into uh, what we're seeing in Barclays and Barclay cards um, during this pandemic. Um, here we go. Can I control the deck? I don't. I don't think it's working for me, Simon. So uh, there we go. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Here we go. So uh, just, I mean, just to to give you a bit of background. Um, on my role. So I, I work for Barclays, but uh, more specifically Barclay Card and Barclays Payments. Um, so what, what my role entails is working with uh, different businesses, different merchants um, who have a requirement to accept debit and credit card payments. So predominantly working up here in the Northwest. And, um, you know, we work with businesses who might have a, a requirement to accept payments in a you know, a face-to-face -face environment and a traditional bricks and mortar and have a requirement to take payments over the phone through either a, a head office function or a call centre. And more and more predominantly, we're, we're working with, with merchants who have a requirement to, to accept payments online through an, through an e-commerce website. Um, so I've actually been working now within the payments uh, sector for, for just over 10 years and and obviously, these these unprecedented times are representing some some major challenges um, to to a lot of our merchants. Um, but at the same time, it, it it is a great time to be working within payments because there are a lot of innovations, new ways of taking payments, and it's great to be able to help 
different businesses in adopting those and uh, ultimately becoming more successful and growing. So, Chris, Ed, you... I might have to pass. Yeah, pass yeah. Just, just tell me when you want to click. There's a huge delay for some reason. If, so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. So, um, we feel we're in quite a unique position within Barclays. Um, because not only are we, a, you know, a consumer and a, and a corporate bank, um, obviously we do have the ability to provide uh, payment acceptance solutions, but we're also a, a card acceptance, uh, sorry, a card issuer as well. And so ultimately what that means is one in three transactions processed in the UK today has a touch point with Barclays or Barclay cards, be that from a, a, a a consumer bank issued debit cards, a Barclay card credit card, or indeed from one of Barclay cards merchants who are accepting the payment. So what that allows us to do is produce some, some really rich data and really rich insights onto how consumers are spending and, and how in particular those consumer habits are changing, particularly during the pandemic. And um, we can go on to the next slide, Ed. So yeah, so what we'll what we'll run through today is is just how how they're changing, and um, a lot of these these data this data is taken from um, October 2020, so it's it's really fresh data, um, and it's the month obviously leading up to the to the second national lockdown, and and just to give you a a, a brief snapshot, and we'll go into a bit more detail. Um, you know, retail performed really well in October, um, showing year-on-year -year growth of 17.2%. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, hospitality and leisure um, has suffered. Um, and then other categories has, has, has slightly declined as well. We can go to the next slide, Ed. So you'll see across the board um, with, with clothing, uh, sorry, with with general retail um, you know general and specialist retailers um, including you know butchers and greengrocers um, have, in, have seen an increase by 30.7 and 13 percent respectively um, so we, we see this really as reaffirming people's support for local businesses and the high street during the pandemic and, and wanting to support the local high street um, the only the only category there within retail um, that, that we've seen a, a slight decrease is, is within clothing. But um, interestingly, we actually saw an increase um, of, of just over 20% of online spend for clothing. So though overall it has declined, you know, we've seen a real shift from purchasing in-store to more home shopping um, during the month of October. And that's a trend that is continuing. We'll go to the next slide, Ed. Interlude that. Got somebody's dog is barking. If you can just make sure you're on mute, just the call. They just had something to add, didn't they? There we go. The dog was very dumb. Well, I hope that wasn't Chris. Beauty of Chris was well, one, one of the beauties of working from home. Yeah, my dog will be going off next. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, eating and drinking out, you know, we see that as a clear impact of, of the introduction of things like the 10 pm curfews. And the more restrictive rule of six, stopping friends and family, you know, going out, eating and drinking in local bars and restaurants. Um, spending entertainment has been compounded by the closure of many venues um, and, and also travel, again, probably the, the least surprising there with the restrictions. It, it, is a, it is a sector that continues to be hit hard during the, during the pandemic. Um, interestingly, um, we, we did see across the board decreases in year on year growth, but um, fast food and takeaway, the fast food and takeaway sector actually saw a growth in October of 18%, um, something of which I can probably account for you know, at least a couple of percent growth in that. But um, yeah, I think um, 
that that is one one area that has seen growth. Um, if we can go to the next slide, Ed. Okay, and then in, in other areas, we, we have seen, again, obvious decreases in fuel spend. So there's more and more people working from home and, and unable to travel um, due to restrictions to, again, see, see friends and family. Um, but we did see a, quite, a, quite an increase within digital content and subscriptions, which grew 32.3%. Um, so this was actually the highest growth that we've seen since the first lockdown was eased in July. And again, we see this as a probably a direct consequence as, as a nation we're preparing ourselves to, to spend more time indoors, so watching TV and, and, and box sets with the with the impending second national lockdown that came uh, that came in November. So we pop to the next side, Ed. So what does this mean? So how are UK consumers actually spending, and what are we seeing? So you know, we saw a renewed swing um, back towards online spending and, and more of a return towards the digital spending habits that we saw during the first lockdown. Um, perhaps, again, unsurprisingly, in-store um, spend did decline. Um, and again, a couple of factors, you know, there's a growing reluctance to visit the high streets. And due to the, the tighter restrictions that, that we're all under at the moment, but there are other factors as well. So, you know, deteriorating weather, you know, that can contribute to, to people, um, you know, declining to go onto the high street, which has obviously seen in-store growth decline year on year. Um, and obviously then you can see we saw some quite strong growth which has been re replicated in, in previous months. So 10.5% increase in spend and a 29% increase in transactions being processed online. And, um, you know, interestingly, we, we, we did see that the, the split between in-store and online of all spend that we saw in October, just over 45% of that was um, internet buying, was, was processed online. And again, that, that, is a, that is a trend that we are seeing that more and more spend is is being carried out online and, and that will likely surpass in-store spend in, in the coming months. So we've gone to the next slide. Yeah, so, and, and this graphic here, I think just, just reiterates, you know, the um, what has gone previous, you know, it, it's not restricted to any particular sector or category. We are seeing year-on-year -year growth with the share of online spend across all different categories, so clothing, grocery, household, they've all seen a, uh, a steady increase in their share of online spend. And go to the next slide. Okay, so I mean, how, how are we supporting? How is the, the market and, and our merchants adapting and, and what are we doing to, to support our merchants and businesses um, during this time. So th there is a, a, a real shift that we found from your more traditional methods of payments to, to shift into more and more online payment acceptance. I think in particular during the, the first lockdown, um, we, we found a lot of businesses we were working with were, were very quick to, uh, to adapt and adopt new, new methods of payment. Um, and those that did uh, would find a, a reap in the benefits during particularly the, the second lockdown, essential retailers who had to close, even bars and restaurants who adapted new methods of accepting payment and, and shifting more of their emphasis to online um, have continued to, okay, not maybe not at the same levels, but they can still continue to trade. Um, as a consequence, you know, we, we're seeing... Things like click and collect, 87% you know, of uh, businesses say that click and collect is their fastest growing method of delivery. Um, I know from a personal perspective, I, that's something that I've taken advantage of, but both you know, with your, your larger retailers, but also the local high street as well. So there's, uh, there's, there's pubs who are, are, are doing home deliveries, click and collect also local retailers on the high street. So it's allowed them 
to continue to to trade during this difficult time. Um, one of the new uh, areas where we're supporting businesses is, is around touchless commerce. And although it's not a brand new concept, and it, it was the the traveller direction for many um, many of our merchants, you know, a, a great example of touchless commerce with, would be someone like a an Uber, whereby they historic, you know, you can you can order a taxi. You can ride in the taxi. You don't even have to put your hand in, in your pocket um, to get your wallet out. There's no cash that is exchanged during that transaction. It's all done through a mobile app. And it's all done online. And, and we've seen um, the adoption of that, particularly within hospitality and leisure. So those of us who have gone out during um, in recent months to you know, bars and restaurants who've been able to welcome their customers back, you know, you can pay via a, a mobile application as opposed to queuing at a, at a bar and it reduces the requirement of human interaction, making it sa- a safer place to be able to take and accept payments. Um, so everything is done online through a mobile application. Um, and, and retailers are also looking to adopt um, more and more touchless commerce. So, um, you know, the likes of Marks and Spencer's um, announced uh, recently that, that over 300 of their stores are actually going to go check out free. Um, so again, you'll be paying for your shopping through mobile app, through online means. Um, and, and that's that's something that is probably, you know, has been expedited as a result of um, of COVID and the, and the pandemic. And, and then finally, you know, yes, there is a real shift towards towards online but you know people still need to take payment in a, in a face-to-face environment and again there's been a real requirement for more mobile uh, solutions so for those who are unable or have a, a, a customer base that that you know can't potentially transact online we can you know we, we've we've looked at implementing mobile terminal solutions where you can take payments on the go so delivery drivers being able to accept payments uh, again, supporting things like click and collect. And that's been backed up by um, the likes of Visa and MasterCard, who in April, uh, back in April, increased contactless limits from £30 up to £45. So again, th- this is all contributing to um, changing consumer spending habits uh, through through both necessity, but also it's it's moving towards more of a, a cashless society where we're seeing more online spend and, and less cash when, when people are making payments. But um, I, I hope that gives you a flavour of, of what we're seeing within the market, gives, gives some useful insights. Um, welcome any, any questions at the end, as, uh, as Simon mentioned in the Q&A. But um, yeah, for now, I'll, I'll hand over to, to Dale. Yeah, very interesting, Chris. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, great to have the opportunity to, to share our story with you this morning. Um, just wanted to say thank you to, to Simon and to Hurst for the opportunity. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, let's, um, let's get straight into our story. So I, what I needed to do was just um, set the, uh, the scene for you, just to give you a little bit of context. So I am one of uh, two co- co-founders of Wine and Something. Um, and I, my role is, is CEO of the company. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on myself, uh, prior to, to starting Wine and Something um, nearly two years ago, I was in the events industry. So I used to own and run an events company, um, which, which was interesting. And we worked with some, some terrific brands. In actual fact, we, we did an event three years running for, for Barclay Card at one of the festivals. Um, and I got a lot of enjoyment out of it, but it was a lot of hard work. And so, um, yeah, I guess, you know, from my perspective, I made a little vow to myself that my next business venture would, would definitely be online and to go into to, to more of a, a, a dig, the digital space. Um, just purely because I think from an events perspective, we were always, once we had finished a great event, we were always back to, to square one, having to uh, you know, look for the next client and put on the next event. And so the, the, the vision was really to 
um, build up our company from an online perspective and an e-commerce perspective, and it wasn't really overly important what, what products we ultimately sold or service for that matter that we sold um, online. The key thing for us was being able to build a sustainable business um, that would offer, um, yeah, just ongoing revenues, passive incomes, et cetera, and to, to run a business that builds on itself and not necessarily has to um, you know, reinvent itself and then start again uh, every, every couple of weeks or every couple of months. So just uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please, Ed. So together with a friend, we decided to, because we both have a passion for wine, we decided to, to start a, um, a wine merchant. And so this goes back, we started to, to trade in February 2018. Um, and so, sorry, 2019, uh, 2018, excuse me, 2018. Um, and so we originally called the company the Social Wine Co. Initially to start off the company, we were self-funded. And so to establish ourselves, the idea was that we would sell into the trade uh, for the first um, year or two, probably even you know, a little bit longer than that, the idea was to build up revenues, to, to grow organically. But there was always a vision for us to, to move online. That, that was always very much a part of the um, uh, strategy. However, um, yeah, to start off with, it, it's a lot to, it, it's a big, it's a big um, requirement to be able to, to do that on, on the scale that we wanted to do it and the objectives that we wanted to achieve. You needed to have some fairly robust investment so we started off selling entirely to the trade. We had um, relatively good success uh, in the sense that we started to bring on some, some very, very good restaurants around the country. We started to uh, work with a lot more corporates. We started to supply wine to a number of different venues, for example, some retirement villages who, who have uh, bars and restaurants. And so everything was going relatively well. You know, um, you know I guess it's all, it's all relative in terms of the size of our company. And then, of course, um, you know, earlier this year, with, with the pandemic hitting, um, I don't think I'll ever forget the date of the 23rd of March that we all went into uh, national lockdown. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, everything does change. So, you know, we had um, a significant amount of stock, if we can move slide, but a quarter of a million pounds of stock um, within, a, within a third party warehouse. Uh, our fixed costs were, were, were pretty substantial. Not only from a storage point of view, but we had offices, um, a number of other costs, um, obviously all of our, our variable costs as well. And of course, we had a number of staff. And so you, you were always very mindful of um, their well-being and, um, you know, mortgage to pay, salaries to pay, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, we have no clients uh, going into this national lockdown. So no revenues coming in uh, with, with some considerable costs. So it did, I mean, you know, Chris alluded to it in his presentation, it did get us to, to rethink our strategy. Not, um, we weren't necessarily gonna change our entire strategy, but what we had to do to survive was to bring our, our digital transformation, you know, uh, forward, which is exactly what we did. So um, Ed, if we can move to the, the next slide. Um, we had a number of other challenges. Uh, we were then looking to, to build our brand, the Social Wine Co. Um, and we, we applied for a trademark, which was blocked by a very small company in Kent, who also they were in the event space and, and sold a minimal amount of wine. But um, it, was a, it was a blessing in disguise, ultimately, because we now have a far more dynamic brand. But at the time, that just added to, to the angst and to, to, to the, the anxiety. Um, but we moved forward. And so um, we then engaged the services of, of Fluid to develop the brand for us. I think we, we gave them an almost impossible brief, but they delivered an incredible uh, brand for us. And so we find ourselves today having uh, just recently uh, in the middle of September launched our new brand um, online. So the new brand is, is Wine and Something. And the reason how that came about is because we, the challenge and the brief was to create a brand that was uh, very, very dynamic and that was very relevant, a brand that we could reach out to, to consumers and be relevant in their lives. And so for us, uh, we, have a, we have a mantra or positioning of good wine goes goes with anything. And so as you can see on the screen, um, some examples, you know, wine and another night with Netflix and Jim Jams, um, your wine and your wonderful family Christmas. So we, we literally can extend our brand um, quite significantly. Um, you know, wine and friends, wine and travel, wine and um, adventure. Uh, there's so much we can do with our brand. We can change our brand, um, you know, on the hour, on the day, on the week, we can continue to make ourselves relevant to, to the consumer. So we launched six weeks ago, uh, middle of September, as I was saying, we are the newest, to my knowledge, we're the newest direct um, to consumer startup in the industry. 
uh, we are starting to build up some, some relatively good clientele. Our social media following is, is starting to, to um, increase uh, on a nice trend. And so everything is starting to move in the right direction. And um, yeah, that, that, that's where we're at at the moment. Um, if we can just move to the next slide, um, is it? So it's been an incredible journey to, to get to where we are. Um, and of course, in amongst that, that, that angst and the panic um, from a couple of months ago, we needed to, to refocus. And I guess our, our biggest takeout out of that entire uh, process was the fact that we needed to go digital and, and everything about this company needs to be, um, yeah, a, as digital as we can possibly make it. And I guess, you know, it goes without saying, uh, from all of our perspective, we will always go digital for, for two reasons. And the first is to, is to manage costs through efficiencies, um, which is important. But I think that the more important one is to really to grow revenues. <clears throat> There's only so many costs you can ultimately manage, but it is really about scalability and how do we, we grow our revenues. So there was a couple of key lessons for us. And the first one is, is knowing your niche. Again, this is not necessarily uh, new to anybody, but I think within knowing your niche, various elements of that are all important. And so from our perspective, yes, we, um, we have a very robust uh, target market with demographics, et cetera, et cetera. But more than that, we needed to create an angle for people to associate with us as a brand. And so we ultimately um, realized that what we are selling is we're selling lifestyle, but lifestyle is, is far too broad um, for anybody to, to really hang their hat on. And how do you, how do you connect with people through that? So after a, um, a fairly long process, the, uh, we came up with um, the unique positioning of supporting Britain's dinner parties. And for obvious reasons, we haven't actually launched that, that position um, as yet, but it is certainly our intention, um, Q1, maybe late Q1 or early Q2 next year to launch that positioning. And the reason why we, we've chosen that is simply because first of all, from a scale perspective, um, hundreds and thousands of dinner parties take place up and down the country every Friday and every Saturday night. So we have a very, very big market to be able to tap into. Um, we also want to uh, generate um, customer acquisition and, and, and do that as, as at the lowest possible cost. So from a cost per acquisition point of view, uh, we need to make sure that we, we stick within certain bounds. And so the commercial benefits of us wanting to support this particular initiative is that, um, and ultimately, I mean, I'll just give you a couple of seconds into it. So what we're looking to do is get people to invite their friends uh, to join their, their social circle or their, their, their online um, dinner party circle. So we're looking to create a very, very basic, but nonetheless, um, social platform to support dinner parties. And so we'll be the first in the country to do that. And the idea is that people will invite their friends to the, uh, to the, to the platform. Just a couple of friends, three or four friends, your friends that you would ordinarily invite to your dinner parties. They would, they would become members of your social circle and um, that circle would get a specific code. And so there's a number of benefits to, to that. Uh, for example, uh, we'll be offering a discount to, um, uh, to all social, so social circle members um, across the, the client database and a number of others. So it'll be very, very worthwhile to, um, to engage in that particular positioning. But from a commercial perspective, why it's important for us is because first of all, we're looking for organic growth. Uh, second of all, we base our customer, um, sorry, our company value on customer equity. So customer equity is incredibly important for us, and that is all about driving and increasing customer lifetime value. So in summary, um, it really is the sum total of your existing clients plus your projected future clients multiplied by their, their customer lifetime value um, gives you, you know, your projected company value, which ultimately leads to shareholder value. So important that we increase our customer lifetime value, important that we decrease our cost per acquisition. We need to give people a reason to switch from existing competitors to our brand, and also retention. And so being able to retain customers, obviously existing customers are the most profitable customers is fundamentally important to us. Second of all, we're able to generate a lot of content through this particular strategy, content that we will use digital platforms to, to scrape off um, user-generated platforms, and we'll be able to publish that, that content to create an ongoing story. So that was very, very important to, to our niche to create an angle that people would be able to um, associate themselves or uh, associate to our brand. Then um, from a wine perspective, uh, absolutely critical for us to have wines that we are totally, that we totally believe in. And I can genuinely say that we have one of the most exciting wine portfolios in the country. 
it's cost us a considerable amount of investment to get to where we're at with regards to wine, because the lady that you see in the picture, her name is Robin Keck, and she's our master of wine. She's one of only um, I think about 405 master of wine that have that qualification around the world now. There's about 10 or 15 people excuse me, that get added to uh, that qualification per annum. So it is very, very sought after. So she is without question one of the, has one of the best palettes in the world. So we've engaged Robin for the last two years um, to open up doors that we could never have opened. And we specialize in um, small independent estates uh, around the world. Um, we will never ever sell commercial wine. So for, all, for us, it's all about um, these gems and there's some incredible uh, producers around the world that nobody really gets to hear about because they are very, very small. So with Robin, we've been able to amass a portfolio of about 250 wines of which 85% are exclusive to ourselves, which is a key, key uh, selling point. The other 15%, there are one or two other small merchants that might um, have beaten us to the punch in terms of finding these producers, but because we love the wines, uh, whilst we look for alternatives, um, we're happy to stock a couple, but the majority of our wines, uh, and they are truly, truly um, exceptional wines, um, are exclusive to ourselves. So, so again, knowing your niche, very, very important, but from a digital perspective, I think, um, there's just a few things that I wanted to, to highlight in terms of knowing your niche because there's, there's elements that facilitate as catalysts um, getting us to this point. So the three things were artificial intelligence. Um, the second was a customer segmentation or, or CRM software. Um, and the third piece is all about digital marketing. So from, from an AI point of view, we, we don't use a huge amount of AI at the moment, but certainly it's something on our radar that we will use more and more about um, as we develop our business. And it's everything from um, the AI, AI powered chat boxes that welcome customers to your site, deal with um, relatively simple you know, inquiries, questions, and ultimately you know, uh, save the customer time and, and, and make the whole process efficient until um, a live agent can engage with that particular customer. So, AI will, will play a very, very important role uh, in our company. Of course, um, artificial intelligence is used to scan through data, to pick up trends, to pick up patterns, which we'll be using for that for um, very heavily. And the reason we will be doing that is because it leads to my second point on customer relationship management. For us, uh, segmentation is absolutely vital. It's an incredibly, incredibly important part of our company. Um, the most important aspect of our marketing is not acquisition, but it's retention. Uh, we, we're more adept in acquisition, but retention is incredibly important. And so the way we communicate with our customers and the way we, we treat them very, very differently um, is going to be vital. So we, we're using um, at the moment our e-commerce software is um, a German product. It's called Shopware. We're the first in the country to use their latest platform, which is, which is their platform 6.2. Uh, it's, it's it was launched in April earlier this year. There's a number of German sites, being a German company and European sites that use it, um, but we're the first in the UK. And it has a very, very good, it has a very good suite of products um, in their enterprise version. But certainly I'd encourage everybody to, to invest in, in bespoke software, for example, CRM, which will make an enormous difference to, um, to the way that you, you approach customers. And then thirdly, with regards to our digital marketing, and, and I'll touch on that in a little bit more greater detail just now, but um, as, as, as you can imagine, for, from our perspective, we don't ever use print materials. It's all digital materials. We won't uh, go down the route of print campaigns. It's all going to be digital campaigns. Uh, we won't take out any outdoor billboards, um, nothing like that at all. Uh, that's all going to be our spend will be towards social media. Uh, we will never have a, a storefront. Um, again, it'll always be online and e-commerce will drive our business going forward. And just in general, uh, we will start to engage some of the, the um, uh, some of the elements that Chris was speaking about, for example, the mobile app and uh, touchless commerce, et cetera, going forward. You need scale to be able to do that. We don't have that at the moment, but it's certainly um, on, on the radar. So some of the digital um, transformation that we've used in this particular area has been key and will continue to, to grow our company. Um, Ed, next slide, please. This is relatively quick in the sense that from a money uh, perspective, um, we, we haven't really used any, any, any digital um, prowess here simply because uh, we self-funded for the first um, 18 months of the company. We then decided to uh, the, our best route to, um, uh, to raise the money that we needed to invest in our website and our e-commerce uh, offering going forward was to meet up with, with private investors, angels, et cetera, which is what we did. And we were successful over two rounds of funding. 
Um, but we haven't gone down the route of things like crowdfunding or using any digital platform simply because, uh, again, of the scale of the company, we didn't feel that those would be um, best serve our particular purpose. And finally, in, in a couple of years time, we have very clear plans to, to exit the business and to, to sell the business in about five years time. And so going forward with regards to investment, it's unlikely that we will use um, digital platforms going forward. But from our perspective, it's probably more about debt finance going forward as opposed to equity, although there might be a third equity raise. And again, we might then use various digital platforms for that, but it's not, it hasn't been a major um, aspect of our business to date in terms of digital transformational technology. Uh, next slide, please, Ed. So one of the, the key areas uh, for us is that we have always had scale in mind, absolutely critical, whether that is with regards to our e-commerce platform. And so we, 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 we effectively have an arrangement to use the enterprise platform, not that we use all of those uh, services and all of the, the entire suite of products with regards to shopware, but certainly it's there when we need it. It's effectively, it's a flexible uh, on-demand um, agreement that we have with them, all the way through to things like um, you know, logistics and, and, um, and storage. And so the image up on the screen is an image that was taken a little while ago of our, of our warehouse here in Guildford. Um, and just to, to, to bring a couple of elements of, of digitization into, into this area of our company. So first of all, we expect, um, we expect our partners, uh, partners like uh, Hillebrand, which is our deep sea you know, freight company, hospitals, you know, our local domestic company, we expect those sorts of partners even for example, from Fleur's perspective, you know, our digital marketing partner to be able to, um, or use their own digital, um, you know, best in breed digital technologies within their own companies, which will ultimately help drive our company. So specifically with regards to, to logistics, we, um, this particular picture is slightly outdated. We actually have on Monday, we have a supplier coming in to do two elements to our warehouse. The first is intelligent lighting. And the second is, is, is effectively a heating system. I couldn't really call it intelligent heating system, but certainly it's far better from a, from a, um, a digital perspective. And what you can see there is uh, this warehouse is, is a pretty old warehouse. It, it uses, um, it, it consumes an incredible amount of energy through these fluorescent lights. There's, there's 20 fluorescent tubes per row times six rows. And so can you imagine completely inefficient? So on Monday, we have the installation going in of um, intelligent lighting. We'll only ever use, need to use two of those rows as opposed to the six. We will be reducing from 120 fluorescent tubes down to 14 LED uh, lights. There'll be seven in each row. And the intelligent part comes in is that they uh, pick up natural light that comes into the warehouse through, we have 50 yard uh, perspex panels on the roof. So they dim up and they dim down according to the natural light that comes into the, um, the warehouse. So obviously in summer, they're gonna be right down dimmed. Um, and also there's motion sensors. So if we're working in one part of the warehouse, the lights on the other side of the warehouse uh, aren't being used. And so it only really lights up where, we, we, where it picks up motion. So again, we've worked out um, the investment for us to, to go that route. We will break even in 18 months. And we have a seven year lease agreement. So the, the digitization in terms of that as a simple example, um, is certainly gonna be saving us, us costs. And from a heating point of view, we started off looking at um, rather big, you know, uh, heating units and AC units, et cetera, and again, realized the power consumption um, that they use, and decided ultimately to go with these, these intelligent fans. So they, they, they blow out hot, hot air, and they have very, very, very powerful, they're small, but incredibly powerful fans that will be placed, or there's eight of them that will be placed around the warehouse that just circulate the air and um, create an ambient heat. And so again, from us, it is a lower investment in terms of that particular infrastructure. Um, but again, with regards to consumption of energy, you know, made a lot of sense. So from our perspective, um, yeah, that, that, those are two key areas. Um, and then just summing up with regards to um, storage logistics and everything that we do with regards to our company, um, we use cloud-based uh, services and that for us is fundamentally important. Um, no need in our um, case to go and invest in, in, in expensive servers no need for us to go and invest in um, expensive you know, software either. Again, I would encourage small business owners to use software on demand and not to invest in, in monolithic, you know, huge you know, IT infrastructure, probably most of which you won't necessarily need. Um, but for us, uh, yeah, cloud-based technology is, is everything that we use and will continue to, uh, to use. Ed, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so we've spoken about some of our logistics partners, um, but for us as a company, our most important partner 
uh, was always going to be uh, our marketing partner. And so we're delighted to work with, with Fluid um, in this regard. And as I said, we, we were extremely uh, pleased with the, the delivery, what they've done for us to date in terms of creating our brand, but more so um, just every aspect of, of, of digital marketing. So I mean, it links into digital sales, but what's key from our perspective is to have a partner that can drive this for us. Um, you know, as a small company, you know, despite where my CEO, you know, cap, I, I do everything in the company along with a few staff. Uh, literally 10 minutes before I jumped on the call, I was um, unloading a, um, an Arctic lorry. We had some wines arriving. We had a couple of pallets arriving from the Wild Valley. So I was jumping in my, my forklifts, getting these pallets off the, um, the truck, etc. So I will literally do, as my staff do, anything that, that really needs to be done. And so one of the key elements is that we cannot afford to take um, our, our eye off the ball from a marketing perspective. And so that is why, um, yeah, Fluid have been a very, very good partner for us. And so when I refer to, to the investment in marketing, the areas that Fluid drive for us, which is just, as I said, I can't um, overemphasize them enough, are elements like, and you'll be familiar with these concepts, um, SMM in terms of social media marketing, SEO, search engine optimization, PPC, pay-per-click, uh, SEM, search engine marketing. So all of those elements, they take care of us, uh, for us on our website. Fundamental in terms of driving acquisition. Um, very, very important. Uh, influencer marketing, they've introduced us to uh, take our email marketing up to the next level. Content marketing, viral marketing. Uh, we're doing a little bit of radio and TV coming up from a digital perspective, very, very small and, and very niched. Um, and then mobile advertising is something that we're going to be considering going forward as well. So there are so many elements of digital marketing and they're all feed into one another, uh, but each and every single one of them is, is fundamentally important to our business. And so um, as a small business, for me, marketing has never been seen as a cost, but it's been seen as investment. And again, I would encourage um, small businesses and you know, any size business really to, to continue to um, digitize your marketing. And I think that's one area that we can all do it relatively quickly and relatively practically as well. If we go to the next slide, please, Ed. So, so you know, coming to an end of my presentation, um, we spent the five months uh, spending night and day just um, getting content done for the website. Um, it was it was a mammoth task. We were using a new software as well, so that that had its challenges. Um, but really, you know, you, we 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 ultimately launched on the 9th of September, and we were very very pleased with what we launched as as a first um, uh, as a first version of our website. We certainly have plans to improve the website and we have, as we've spoken about our wine and friends concept and a number of other elements that we'll be launching into the website. But having launched, excuse me, having launched um, and being very proud of ourselves, what we did realize is that sitting back over the next two to three weeks, as a few friends ordering on the site, we now realized um, that the, the work is only starting now and the journey is only really starting now to be able to um, drive back uh, customer acquisition and ultimately to be able to, to retain those customers. So next slide please, Ed. So we've adopted um, a very, very simple approach um, with, with regards to, to that, um, that element. And it's all about, for us, it's about the build which we've been through. It's then about um, uh, measuring. And so we measure on, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, um, some key metrics. And so those, those metrics, for example, our key metric at the moment is conversion rate. Um, Last month in the month of November, again, we're small, but we drove 4,000 unique visitors to our, our website. And when we just take our conversion rate, for example, you can do the math, but um, a, a conversion rate of 1%, conversion rate of 2%, a conversion rate of 5%, all of a sudden by driving the same amount of users to the site, the conversion rate makes an immense difference to the success of this particular company. And so um, that's one of our key metrics at the moment. And we, so, so we build, we measure, we then learn through the data that comes back. Uh, we then tweak things. We don't advocate making you know, wholesale changes um, too often because you can often um, you know, burn capital very, very quickly. Some small tweaks to do with regards to e-commerce sometimes goes a long way. Um, a, B, test everything that you do as those, those, you make those tweaks, learn again, run the data again, see how conversion rates, profit per customer, customer lifetime value, see how all of these metrics start to um, improve or, or not, as the case may be, and then evolve. So, so we need to continually take that data um, and evolve. We need to, to use that data to uh, our advantage. So, so thank you. That's me. And this last slide, um, it would be a mess of me 
as a small business owner not to uh, create a sales opportunity. And so I wanted to thank you for the time this morning. And we're currently running on our website a, a 10% off all of our wines as a Christmas special. Um, but for all of you this morning, uh, feel free to pass it on to uh, friends and family. We've created a code, first 10, as you see it on the screen, which will be an extra 10% on our wine. So we'd love you to um, enjoy some of our wines, uh, experience our brand. Um, yeah, and thank you. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Dale. Just to let everybody know, we will circulate that as well with the uh, the slides and the uh, the video at the end, so you'll have a, a record of that. Okay, thanks, Dale. Ben, over to you. Cool, thanks. Thanks, Dale. Um, really interesting uh, story in terms of wine and, and great to work on that brand. Um, hopefully I can keep you for the, the third part of this and then not all scrambling to use your 10% discount on some great wines, but uh, I would <laughs> blame you if you, if you are and, uh, and, and go for it. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Ben um, from, from Fluid Ideas. Uh, we're a full service uh, brand first creative agency. And I guess my part of the, 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 the team and part of the agency and, and the guys I work with the search and social is, um, when all the creative guys and everybody else in the in, in in the agency have crafted these these great looking brands and, and and designs, we kind of take it and look to to grow it and and, and craft what those brands look like in a, in a digital space from uh, organic and paid search, organic and paid social media, Spotify, emails, programmatic, anything that, that that's digital. Um, we we kind of look at the, the touch points there. And today, um going to take you through a bit of a whistle stop tour of some of the innovations that are coming up in the in the digital space some stuff that you already know and, and, and where those platforms are going um, and then ending off on um, kind of like five takeaways. I always like when I join these webinars and, 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 and talks like this to have five things you can kind of take away and, and, and action pretty much straight after, after the talk. Um, so we'll, we'll be taking questions at the end because it, uh, it might be a bit of a, wh a whistle stop tour. Um, and if anybody wants to jump on and kind of have the, a, a bit of a deep dive in terms of any of the, um, the, the specific bits, then they're uh, happy to do so as well but uh but yeah let's let's jump into it ed let's uh it's the, the first one so yeah old tactics new tricks um all, all all of these platforms that we're going through you will you will know of um but the, the idea is that covid and just generally the direction of, of digital has really accelerated some some interesting changes and some really fantastic opportunities for for brands and businesses to to take them to the next level um so starting off with the uh, next next slide please the first old tactic, SEO, search engine optimization. We all know um, what Google is and, and, and all the others, but I won't be talking about uh, to Bing today. Um, but from a, a personal perspective, you know, it's, it's, the one, it's the gateway to the internet, whether you are researching um, a new coffee brand you want to buy or how to fix the radiator you've just accidentally pulled off the wall. Google is the place that, that most people go to. Um, and... From a marketing perspective, it's, it's kind of like the holy grail in that I think the best way that I've, I've heard it described is all of the paid activities that you can do on digital is a bit like renting a house or ranking highly on Google is more like buying a house and paying off your mortgage and the, 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 the benefits that it can give to, to your business. And, and I guess to put into context the importance of, of optimization, um, there's, a, there's a stat floating around that around 90.63% of all content um, on the website actually gets no clicks from Google. Um, and the, the, the reason for that is people fall off the first couple of pages and, and into the depths of Google that we never go to. But um, in terms of the, the, the new tricks, so the next slide, please. Google are about to, uh, in, in April next year, introduce this thing called Core Web Vitals, um, which sounds like a load of techie jargon, uh, and it pretty much is. But I guess to put it into a, um, a more human lens, Google, like Pinocchio, kind of wants to be a real boy. Um, they, Google know that if they understand what people want and when they click through from search results to, to those websites and, and, and make people happy, then more people keep coming to, um, to Google in order to, to, to do their searching. So they want to make sure that the websites that rank on the first page and the, the second page and, 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 and high up on those pages deliver the best performance so that people keep coming back um, to them. Um, next, next slide, please. So here's some more jargon, and this is what Core Web Vitals looks like. But I'll uh, it, it's again with with a kind of human hat on. It's it's incredibly simple, and and for me, I believe that Google are kind of doing us all a favour and making the internet a much better place. And um, so to, to kind of to wrap some of this up and what it means for your websites and and in terms of your ranking. So the first one, largest contentful paint. What that is is just the load time. We all hate slow loading websites. There, we you know nobody's got any 
um, any time to wait around for things to load. So that, that's literally that. Make sure that the most important things load fast on your website. Second link, kind of linked to that, the first input delay is how quickly the interactivity on your website comes into play. Um, and that's very much based on, on what people are coming to your website for. And YouTube is a, is a great example of this, ironically owned by Google. Um, but the next time you, you go onto YouTube, you'll notice that the first thing that loads is the video and all the comments and the suggested settings and everything else loads last and, and kind of what we call lazy loads because Google know that you want to go to YouTube to watch a video. Um, and the final part of Core Web Vitals um, is this thing called cumulative layout shift. Personally, I think this is the most exciting thing. Um, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, mainly like news websites and stuff where you, you go to a website, you're reading something, and then a pesky display ad or some other part of the website loads really slow and moves the page from where you are. Um, or you go to click something and the page moves and you click something wrong accidentally. Um, Google is now monitoring websites that do this and will actively downrank them in the search results um, if, if that happens. And for, for me, all of these three things combined um, are essentially going to make the internet a much better place, but it means that your websites need to be optimized for these. Um, otherwise, you'll kind of lose out on the, on the organic ranking. Um, and I think the, 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 the biggest thing to take is, is to just check, check your own websites. Um, and an easy way to do that is to just Google for uh, their, their Core Web Vitals Chrome plugin, plugin, or just go to Page Insights for Google and you can kind of stick your own website in and check that out. Next slide, please, Ed. So social media. Um, which is, which is now an old tactic. It's, uh, if you think about Bebo and MySpace, social media has also been around for, for ages and ages now, um, but incredibly powerful for businesses. Um, there, are, there are multi-million, multi-billion pound startups, the likes of Hugel and, and Jim Shark in, in, the, in the UK, and um, soon to be one on something, um, that uh, they're, they're completely built on social in terms of um, how, how they've grown their businesses. Um, and, and, you know, 2.7 billion people over that now um, are connected to Facebook um, on the planet. So, I definitely don't need to tell you all the, the importance of social media as a channel for, for business. Um, but that, that new tactic, next slide, please, is uh, social commerce. Probably the, the, the biggest kind of shift in terms of social, um, definitely in the Western world. And we talked already today about e-commerce and the shift from shopping on the high street um, to, to, to buy digital. And, and that's really been amplified during um, COVID. But the next stage of that is you know, you, you go onto Instagram and you see a nice pair of trainers, you click on that ad, it opens up a shop front within Instagram, you click buy and you've never actually left the platform. It's completely seamless for the user and, and removes all of the friction of going anywhere else. Um, and Facebook and their group of platforms um, and, and channels that they, they own are hot on this and leading the charge. So recently this year, they've, uh, and all of those on Instagram probably have noticed this, they've now introduced this little shopping button on Instagram, so you can almost, cheers out for the highlighter, um, you can almost uh, window shop and go through and buy stuff. But also literally this week, um, they've introduced a new functionality to WhatsApp called Carts, where a, if you've got a product catalog collected to, to, to WhatsApp, you can go on, add a load of items to a, a virtual shopping cart, send that as a message to the retailer, um, and then essentially make a purchase, which is, which is crazy really that um that, that we're moving towards this direction of uh, of reduced friction and, and social commerce next slide please the leaders in this um as with a lot of things in the, in the tech space of china and um, they're, they're they're blazing away in terms of this space and I, they're one of the big i can't remember if it was ali Alibaba or one of the big kind of um platforms over there came over to this country and was amazed that people still go on websites to buy products um which is bizarre uh, and this chap here, Li Jackie, um, otherwise known as the Lipstick King in China, is uh, China's version of a, an influencer or a, a KOL that they call them over there. Um, and it's social commerce has merged into this weird reinvention of QVC now over there. And, and this guy essentially just tries on lipsticks and various other products um, and, and sells it to a ridiculously high rate. And during Singles Day in China, which is like their version of Black Friday, um, managed to generate $145 million worth of sales in one live stream on a day. So in terms of the direction that it's going, it's um, it's incredibly great. And I guess takeaway there is if you're already in the e-commerce space or, or you're looking to grow that, make sure that you, your finger's kind of on the pulse in terms of where it's going with social commerce. Next slide, please. 
so TV, it's, it's kind of weird that, to have this slide in here as a digital marketer because I tend to always be um, a, a, a bit wary of, of old, the old traditional um, platforms as a bit of a, a, a geeky social person. Um, but, you know, TV ads it, have normally been out of reach of, of a lot of those incredibly expensive, full of wastage because you hit a lot of people that, um, that, that don't even want to see your ad and are not interested um, and, and have no targeting opportunities like, like you can with digital. Um, where that's changing, though, is the introduction of um, Sky Ad Smart. So Sky have kind of, you know, noticed this and they know people don't watch adverts. That's why they invented Sky Plus, where people can essentially skip the ads. Um, but what they have introduced um, is this addressable TV platform called Sky Ad Smart, which the, the, the main benefit is, um, it, is cost of entry. So it starts at around uh, three gram, which is much cheaper than, than TV. Um, and it's incredibly targeted. So as you increase um, your media budget on, on Sky Ad Smart, not only can you target postcodes, but you can then layer Experian credit card data to start looking at purchasing habits and demographics. You can layer Tesco club card data, next card data to start mapping on literal shopping habits from, from stores. Um, and it's just incredibly powerful. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I guess this is what it looks like. And, and it, it's also part of um, a, a series of developments where traditional is morphing into something new. So if you look at the audio space, we're doing a lot of things, um, including for Dale at One and in, in Spotify and how that's changed what is traditional radio as has DAX advertising in that space. Um, and I think it, it's making a lot of these traditional platforms a lot more accessible um, for, for all of us, really. So I'd, um, I'd definitely um, suggest, suggest jumping on that. It's a really good platform. Next slide, please. So Kim Kardashian, uh, old old tactic, um, but not necessarily just her, um, a, a lot of the other Kardashians, but influencers. Um, and again, it's weird to be talking about influencer marketing as an old tactic, um, but you could argue that it's been around forever. I'm fairly certain that cavemen were uh, were telling each other that they've found this new product called a, a wheel uh, or fire and how great it was. So that, that whole idea has been around for ages. But the old tactic here is the likes of Kim Kardashian and all these big celebrities, when influencer marketing kind of started to take off, again, it kind of put it out of the reaches of a lot of us in terms of the expense. Um, you know, the Kardashians charge millions and millions of dollars in order to um, sit there with a photo of some perfume, whatever that is, um, Kim is, uh, is holding there. But um, the new tactic in the influencer space and the, and the kind of way to take it is, I guess, don't go chasing the big numbers. So nano influencers, micro influencers, people with between, you know, nanos one and 5,000 um, Instagram followers and, and, and micros kind of five to 10. The key benefits are, again, cost to entry. Most of these people are, you know, they're kind of budding Kim Kardashians. They want to be global influencers. Um, so they're happy to take your products as just a gifted opportunity and then showcase it to their followers. And um, we're doing a lot of this with like Dale said with, with one and at the moment. But the, the benefit is the likes of Kim Kardashian, she probably doesn't even manage her own Instagram account. It's so disconnected in terms of that community. Whereas these people that are growing loyal fan bases as nano influencers, They'll go through each comment and, and reply to somebody and, and, you know, shout out how great the product was to, to try. They'll really nurture this community of followers that are, that are so engaged that when they say go out and buy this, their followers do because they, they hang on their every word because they're, they're part of this community. And um, so it's, it, it's definitely a great um, opportunity in order to, to grow social and um, just pop on the, the next slide, please, Ed. Um, here's a shameless plug, um, live example. So we did some work with East Midlands Railway, um, who uh, the you know travel industry, COVID has kind of decimated those as well. But looking to um, expand their audience, and that that's another good thing that these nano influencers are, are great for. We have a bit of a battle with East Midlands Railway, as if you can imagine, their Instagram account is full of train fanatics, I'll call them. Um, so using the likes of influencers to reach new audiences in this, this kind of travel and leisure and, and, and young couple space um, is, is working really well for them. And posts like this went out and they suddenly get a, a massive leap of, of thousands more impressions than they get on a daily um, basis. Next slide, please, Ed. So I guess that there's some of the 
the innovative stuff um, that, that we're looking at in terms of what's coming next or is kind of here on the on the horizon and all very much accessible stuff that you can kind of go away and, and look to try now, especially as we, you know, we start to move into a recovery phase and, and looking at really growing um, what, what your digital presence looks like. Um, but the next things are, are, are things, like I said, that you can take away straight after this presentation and pretty much implement straight away um, and just some interesting stuff as well. So uh, let's jump into the first one. So Google Analytics, um, this presentation is not sponsored by Google, by the way, I just thought I'd throw that in, but they uh, they, they do spend a, 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 a lot of time controlling the internet. So uh, that's why they're in here. But you might have heard of Google Analytics. Chances are you might have it on your website, but you might not really check it. Um, it's an incredible source of information to find out which traffics are drive, uh, or channels are driving the most traffic to your website. If there are any major issues that, that can be flagged to, you know, if you've got average session duration of two seconds on your website, that's an instant red flag and you can start looking into to why that is. Um, and I guess interesting one, I'm not sure if they're on the call, but researching some of the people on this call, it's definitely worth installing the Google Tag um, Inspector Chrome plugin and just checking if you've got analytics installed, but also if it's installed correctly. Um, somebody who was signed up to this has got four versions of analytics installed on their website at the moment. Um, which means that you're technically duplicating your traffic four times. It uh, looks great, but isn't uh, realistic. So uh, definitely give that one a check. Next slide, please. Secondly, um, so let you into a bit of a secret. Um, your phones are not listening to you. Um, just there's an incredible amount of data pinging around uh, the digital ecosystem. Uh, and if your phone's already listening to you, I've not spent enough on these platforms to obviously get access to the, the phone listening capabilities in terms of targeting. But where most of that comes from is the Facebook pixel and the, the LinkedIn insight tag and all these cookies um, that track you around the website, uh, well, around the internet. And I think it's, it's great to get these installed on your website because the instant thing you can do is start remarketing. Um, and there's nothing worse than you see a great pair of socks and you click through to the website and you think, yes, those, web, those, those socks are amazing. And then you, you go away and you forget completely what the website is. And then it's lost forever because you've, you've done a million other things with remarketing. If you own that sock company, you, you can suddenly a day later or an hour later reappear on someone's social feed and your conversion rate then starts to rocket because you're, you're constantly in front of people. And we all know it. We're, we're all followed by all kinds of uh, brands on, on remarketing, but that's definitely, want to, to implement on your website if you've if you've not got it already. Next slide, please. Um, so employee advocacy, um, if, if you've not got a great brand presence on, on social already, um, then this this could be a great tool to to really showcase your brand and grow your reach in, in an easy way. Um, most of the time a lot of your employees might have social um, Chat, um, social profiles and some of them might be really active on that and um, so there's a tool called easy advocacy and um, which we always recommend and you can pop on there create an email list of all your employees create a, a really new like great brand message so say you're launching a new, a new product or going into a new vertical put a really great graphic into it click go and it sends an email to all your employees with a, a, a linkedin share button a facebook share button and a twitter share button all they have to do is click that button and they will have shared that message. And if you've got 10, 15, hundred employees still sharing that message, then you'll suddenly your reach and, and your brand awareness on social is, is, is tripled or, 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 or tenfold um, what, what it would be if you were just trying to loud hailer um, your, your brand's messages on a, on a, on a branded account. So definitely check that out. Easy advocacy, um, really, really great tool. Um, next one. So these last two are kind of um, they're kind of just cool things, but also really interesting and great for research. So for those who've never come across it, um, Google has this thing called trends.google.com where you can put in pretty much anything and it will tell you how much people search for that term um, on the Internet. Um, so it's a it's great because you can kind of see just generally what's going on in the world so for social it's great to see you know some of the conversations we should tap into and um, but if you're thinking about launching a new product or you're looking to go into a new space you could actually start at google trends 
from a research perspective, just to see how popular that idea is or, or how many people are actively looking for, for that product. Because if you go on here and loads of people are searching for it and then you search for it yourself and there are not many companies offering it, that's an instant green light that there's a space in the market for that product. Um, and it also gives you interesting, interesting trends as well. So um, client that we were with, um, Groovy, I don't know, I think the link's on the call, Hi, Monica, if you're still on. Um, we were looking at some Harry Potter um, data for them in terms of um, um, the Harry Potter houses. Um, and we put in all four houses into this, um, in, into this Google Trends um, platform. And it spit out that Slytherin are the most searched for house, um, Harry Potter house globally. Um, which might not have always been the case. It might have been Gryffindor before COVID, but obviously one of the um, the things that have come out of the pandemic is that we've all turned a bit uh, a bit evil and gone towards Slytherin, um, which is interesting. So next slide, last one. And the final one, um, and th this one can get su super addictive, so try not to lose the rest of your day on it. But uh, one of the, the great things that came out of the Cambridge Analytica scandal um, was that Facebook, went on this instant drive to be more transparent. Um, and what that's resulted in is this thing called the Facebook ads library, where you can pop in and search any brands um, that are on Facebook and look at the ads that they're running right now. Um, so this example, in terms of doing some, some competitive research for, for Dale at Wineland, pop into Lathwaite's and we can see all of the adverts that they're currently running. Um, the obvious benefit is if you pop a competitor in and they're not running any ads, then you know that it's going to be an instant win to start Facebook advertising because you've got that instant um, jump on them. Similarly, if you put something in here, a brand in here, and their ads are really terrible, then you can probably get ahead of them just by spending a bit more time on your creative and, and doing something that's that's social first. So um, I spend a lot of time here getting the kind of creative juices flowing from a, a, a social ads perspective. It's really good to look at the likes of Huel who are often running over 600 plus Facebook ads at any one time. Um, they're, they're definitely an interesting brand to look at. So um, definitely take a look at that. And that is my whistle stop tour. So I'll uh, thank you for listening. I'll hand back over to, to Simon. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ben, and thanks, Dale, and, uh, and Chris as well. Um, Ed, as well, thank you for cycling through the slides for us. If you can just close those out, thank you. We can uh, open up to, to Q&A now. So if you've got any questions for our panellists, if you just come off um, mute and, uh, and fire away.